Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. Everyone has been asking my opinion on the elections. Just the other day in Columbia, it was between basically their version of Bernie Sanders. And if Bernie Sanders had been a uh, in, in, into guerrilla warfare, <laughs> if he had been a guerrilla rebel <laughs> hiding out in the woods or in the jungle selling drugs, uh, then it would be Bernie Sanders. And uh, then their version of, of Donald Trump and uh, the Bernie Sanders guy won. So everyone, and by the way, this Bernie Sanders guy, not only was he a FARC rebel, uh, but he was buddies with Chavez, Maduro, Carrera in Ecuador, all of these crazy socialist guys that uh, do everything in their power to become a dictator. And which all, it seems like all the socialists in, in, South America, that's it's pretty much their playbook. That, that's just what they do is they try to pander to the poor people. And then once they get in power, they just try to eliminate uh, the democratic process and try to eliminate term limits and all these. Uh, Correa did the same thing, but he just wasn't successful. It's like they all do that. It's like you would think that the people down here would, would figure that out after they've seen it just over and over and over and over and over again. But it's a big deal for some reasons, and it's kind of a, a nothing burger for other reasons. So it's a big deal because I guess Colombia, it's has been a long, long time since they uh, elected someone on the left, which tells you, I think globally, the political winds are changing. And although we may be rebel capitalists, I think there's more and more people out there that are sympathetic to not only socialism but very the idea of being anti-capitalist or anti-free market capitalism and there's a lot of people that are very sympathetic to central planning and also of course for whatever reason i'm not quite sure why but the socialists and the central planners seem to be very environmentally friendly or this is the this is their pitch now Realistically, they don't care about the environment. They don't care about the temperatures in the ocean. They simply care about getting elected. And if saying they're a tree hugger uh, gives them a higher probability of being elected, well, guess what? They're a tree hugger. So they're, they're just going to tell you what you need to hear in order to vote for them. So uh, this is why it, it's, you know, this is not a good thing at all by any stretch the good news is the guy only has about a f i don't know how their political system really works but from what i've read uh he, he really can't do anything so he's a crazy that really can't do anything because his power is so limited by the fact that his party only has like a, a 15 percent share of the vote in, in their Congress or something like that. I'm sure those of you on the live stream that are from Columbia can correct me on this, but, but the bottom line, the concept is still the same. The details might differ, but the concept is his party doesn't have much power. So even if he wants to do something in the next four years, he's probably not going to get anything done. So that's the good news. And uh, for me, the best government is one that can't do anything. I've always said my favorite president would be someone who gets elected and then just goes to the golf course for four years and just just don't do anything. <laughs> Doing nothing would be a lot better than trying to get a lot accomplished because you're just making things worse. So that's the good news. And another thing that is good is the, the probability is very high that we go into a global recession. Is it inevitable? No. Is it imminent? Maybe not. Um, but the probability is, is very, very high. So if we go into a global recession and this guy's president, especially if the economy really takes a hit in Colombia, which it most likely would, probably will everywhere in the world, he's going to get blamed. Just like Biden, he's going to get blamed. Whether it's right or wrong, doesn't matter. He's going to get blamed. So that's good. 
when uh, if they get a, a recession, if it's blamed on socialism, even though it's not his fault directly, uh, it will prompt those people in the country to get him out of office just as fast as they got him in and go back to, uh, although they're all bad, the politicians are all terrible. Even the guy before was maybe on the quote unquote right, but he was very, very sympathetic to the global elite and the World Economic Forum and all of these things. So uh, at least they could go back to someone that, that might be more friendly to free market capitalism. So uh, I guess my other views on the matter are the peso going down, you know, because I like to look at this from a standpoint of personal freedom and liberty, for sure. Uh, but also from a standpoint of macro and what this is going to do to the peso, what it might do to real estate. From a standpoint of uh, personal freedom and liberty, I, I don't really think it'll move the needle too much. Uh, again, the guy really can't do anything as of right now. Hopefully it stays that way. And uh, I always like to set things up as, as though I'm a tourist. So I don't like spending more than four or five months a year in Colombia anyway. So as long as I'm just a tourist, you know, whomever is president really doesn't affect me. As an example, I've been in the United States uh, for the last, call it eight weeks with uh, speaking engagements. And uh, although there's a crazy socialist in the White House, it hasn't really affected me too much. <laughs> so uh, hopefully the same thing with Columbia. So now let's move over to the macro. Now, this could change if he tries to, and somehow, you know, takes more and more control over the government. And again, I don't know that that's possible the way their system is set up. I don't know if it's as easy to do as it was in Venezuela or as uh, they didn't they weren't able to achieve it. But uh, or as easy as it might be in, in places like Ecuador. Uh, my guess is it's probably harder in Colombia or uh they, they would have gone down this path um, in the past. So uh, setting that aside, and I, I again, I'm not too worried about it, but I'm definitely cognizant of what's happening. That is for sure. So let's look at the macro. I think what this means for the peso is there is going to be a lot of downward pressure. So let, let's actually pause for a moment and think about this in terms of Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory. And I'm super excited. Brent is going to be speaking at Rebel Capitals live this weekend. But let, let's think about dollar denominated debt. Because one of the things this knucklehead in uh, ironically is the last name is Petro. One of the things he wants to do is he wants to completely eliminate any future investment in Columbia for fossil fuels, <laughs> which I know a lot of these people that vote for him, that the greenies say, oh, my gosh, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, the, the greenies historically don't have that great of a grasp on macroeconomics. <laughs> so let's let's go through that momentarily here. This is the uh, a blog post from 2021 on the Fed's website. Well, the the, the Fred, the Federal Reserve Bank of, of St. Louis, and very helpful. So this is the dollar exposure in public debt. So it lists all of these countries in Asia, and we're going to get into Colombia in just a moment. But it lists all of their uh, the, the the percentage of total government debt they have denominated in dollars. So here, our our highest is uh, looks like Saudi Arabia, and then next is Indonesia, and then Israel. Okay, so now let's go down here to Latin America. So number one is Argentina. So we always hear about Argentina having problems with their sovereign debt collapse and they, 
they have to default on their debt and blah, 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 blah. It's because so much of their debt is denominated in dollars. And if they don't have the dollar cash flow coming in to service the debt, well, what do they have to do? They have to print Argentinian pesos to buy the dollars to pay the debt, which creates greater demand for dollars on the global FX market and more supply of Argentinian pesos, which is why they have a currency crisis pretty much every 10 years <laughs> or whatever it is, constantly, constantly. And that's why they have one of the main reasons they have all of this, uh, all these problems with consumer price inflation, constant consumer uh, price inflation. Look at number two. This would be Colombia. So at 30%, over 30% as of 2021 of their outstanding debt, government debt is denominated in dollars. Well, this usually wouldn't be that big of a problem for Colombia. Why? Because their biggest export is oil. And what do they sell their oil for? You guys know this dollars. You got it. So they're selling all this oil out to the market and they're getting dollars in return. So they're, they're matching up their assets with their liabilities. So they're matching up their cash flows, let's say, to a certain degree with their liabilities. So I think their mindset was probably, well, let's take on more dollar denominated debt because we'll always have the dollar or most, we'll, we'll, for the next two decades, we'll have plenty of dollar denominated uh, dollar cash flow coming into the country. And therefore, we'll have dollars to pay this debt, even if it's 30% of our uh, total outstanding. So what the Greenies and Petro comes along and says, oh, we've got to move into the future. We've got to get rid of all the fossil fuels. We've got to stop investing in oil. And within 10 years, I, I don't know what his specific claims are, but I'm paraphrasing. But basically, you know, within 10, 15 years, we want to reduce the amount of oil exports. We want to reduce Colombia's uh, dependency on oil exports, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you can see, and this stuff obviously frustrates me quite a bit. And, you know, first thought is it, it's just such a scarcity mindset socialists have. They, they can never, ever, ever contemplate growing the economy. They can only contemplate dividing the, the economy as it is as though increasing the pie is just not an option, right? So if you want to decrease the economy's dependency on oil, well, what I would do is I would simply grow the economy, <laughs> right? Let's say that oil represents, let's just throw out a number, 40% of the economy right now. Fantastic. Well, the other 60%, just grow that by 100%. And guess what? The economy is far less dependent on oil. Oil as a percentage of GDP goes from, let's just say, 40% down to 20%. Problem solved. But no, 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 no. That's not the way a socialist thinks. The way they think is our economy or whatever is, let's just say, we'll use U.S. numbers, uh, 20 trillion, 23 trillion, whatever it is. And let's say oil is, is 10 trillion. We want to say, well, we want to reduce that to where, uh, you know, oil is only $4 trillion of our economy. And instead of saying we want the economy to grow to $40 trillion, and therefore oil is a much lower percentage or far less dependent. Now, I know that doesn't address the environmental concerns, but let's just take this one step at a time. Uh, they're saying that they want to reduce the dependency, not from a greeny standpoint, but just... The whole economy is dependent on oil. That's not good. So let's reduce its dependency by decreasing oil. Okay. Again, my point would be let's just increase the economy. Much better way to tackle that problem. Now, they want to sit there and talk about all the environmental damage and all these things. That's fine. That's a different conversation. 
But in order to do that, you've got to have a cost benefit analysis, right? So let's just assume that uh, this Petro guy is able to reduce the amount of uh, investment in oil and he's able to decrease the oil exports from, let's just say, uh, whatever, 100 billion a year down to 50 billion a year for in an effort to be more green, right? Uh, okay, okay. Well, that's that's the benefit side of the equation. Now, what's the cost side? Well, the cost is you're going to have $50 billion less coming into the coffers to pay the outstanding dollar-denominated debt. There most likely is going to be a shortfall. Then what do you do? Now, all of a sudden, you're in the exact same position as Argentina. You've got to print pesos, got to sell those pesos for dollars, which makes the peso go from 4,000 to 5,000. Or yeah, again, I'm just picking numbers out of the air. It's about 4,000 now. But does it go to 5,000? Does it go to 6,000? I don't know. But it, it, it gets far, far, far weaker against the dollar, which does what? Increases consumer price inflation. So all of these people at the bottom of the economic totem pole get squeezed. Listen, if, if prices for food goes up or rent goes up in Colombia by 10%, what do I care? I, I could care less. In fact, if the peso devalues to an even greater degree, I win. I, I come out a huge winner. Number one, because real estate is a pretty decent inflation hedge, not one-to-one, -one, but pretty decent. But what happens is all of my payroll is in, is denominated in pesos, obviously, but yet a lot of my income is denominated in dollars. <laughs> so let's just say my, uh, my payroll right now per month is $10,000. If the peso goes to 5,000, Boom, all of a sudden it goes down to call it $8,000 or $7,000 or whatever it would be. So my expenses just go down and down and down and down. So my my uh, overall costs decrease, even though I might be paying a little bit more for food. So contrast my situation to someone that's in strata one or something. And the strata is how they, uh, how they separate the specific neighborhoods in uh, Medellin for property taxes and for uh, energy costs and whatnot. So strata one is like the poorest area. Strata six is the richest. So how does it affect the people in strata one, two, three, you know, where half of their paycheck is going to food? Well, that absolutely crushes them. Uh, and now Medellin or Colombia as a whole is pretty good for food, pretty self-reliant, except for grain. Uh, they got to. They have to bring in a lot of grain, which also filters into proteins. So you can get tons of mangoes, but you're not going to be able to get a lot of beef, or the price of beef really going to go up. Although the price of of papaya, or something like that, or coffee, is probably going to remain relatively low. So th this is uh, what happens when these socialists get into power. That. Ironically, they end up disproportionately hurting the portion of the population that actually vote for them because they have all these feel-good slogans and policies that uh, once you understand economics, you realize are going to make things far, far worse for the people that they are supposed to help. And I think the big lesson here is good economics or, or uh, and, and what I mean good economics, I mean accurate economics, is very counterintuitive. It, it, it would seem like, well, the best thing to do to help poor people is just give them money. Makes sense, right? But what we see is, is actually the opposite is true over the long run that maybe you have a welfare 
uh, system set up, but by giving them stimmy checks, as an example, in the United States, did that hurt the poor people or help them? Short term might have helped them, but long term, it's going to hurt them far more than it helped in the short term. And that's just one small example of economics being counterintuitive. And uh, stuff is complex. So how many of those greenies that voted for Petro understand the problem if they implement his policies, the problem they are going to have servicing their dollar denominated debt? My guess would be very close to 0%. And then out of those people that might understand the dollar denominated debt problem, how many of those can connect the dots and understand what that does to the peso, what that does to the inflation, and what that does to the poor and middle class. Now you've just got basically a handful of people. So we're moving into a world where in order to set up your portfolio and to make good decisions and to understand what's happening, not only in your own neighborhood, your own city, but in the world around you, you really have to have a thorough understanding of good economics. And that's why you're here. <laughs> and that's what I'm super passionate about. So if you guys keep watching the videos, I'll keep doing them. <laughs> How, how's that for an agreement? All right, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. Make sure you check out Rebel Capitalist Live, rebelcapitalistlive.com this weekend, Miami. So I got the flamingo shirt on. And uh, we'll see you here in a couple days. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.